Goodbye, 2023. Now that he's gone, let's talk about him behind his back as Lupin Larry and their special guests Neil Temple and Virgin Radio's Backstage Ben review the pop culture phenomenon that was 2023. Hey, 2024, I hope you're listening. We have pretty big expectations. I got you. In a world filled with intergalactic space battles, metahuman destruction on a global scale, and psychopathic serial hauntings, there's only one team who can make sense of it all. When your world is overrun with rampant pop culture, call Lupin Larry, Guardians of Geek. <laughs> yep, yep, it's a brand new year, but it's not a brand new explosion. <laughs> it is not. Same explosion, yep. new year. Uh, it's Loop and Larry, Guardians of Geek. I'm Loop. And I'm Larry. This is one of my favorite shows of the year. This is the 2023 uh, look back um, hits and misses episode. And uh, let's, let's just get to it. That's right. It's our sixth annual year in review 2023 <laughs> it was a huge year big pop culture year and because of that we bring back our biggest pop culture nerds uh, <laughs> should i say geeks i know i think nerds is offensive i'm gonna say geeks <laughs> biggest pop culture geeks <laughs> neil temple and backstage ben who are going to be talking all about their favorites their hits their misses all the good, all the bad that happened in 2023. So let's just start right off the top. Loop, take it away. <laughs> all right. So this is our annual show. And so what we do is we do hits and misses. Hits, obviously, of and movies, TV. We have sort of an open category as well. And then we'll look at things that we're looking forward to in 2024. Uh, as well, um, for the misses, when we say miss, it doesn't necessarily mean it was terrible. It could be something that was decent, but it didn't maybe didn't live up to expectations or just something just didn't connect with you for whatever reason. Everything's subjective. I have one I think is going to like destroy Larry um, when we get to the misses <laughs> in movies, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, so let's start with movies and we'll uh, start with Ben and we're going to do hits. We'll go hits. We'll go hits and misses in all the categories, but we're going to start with hits. So Ben, movie what, what's your favorite movie of the year what's a big hit for you thanks for picking me first i didn't want anybody yeah. else to steal it but um <laughs> spider-man across the spider-verse was just that's my hit of 2023 possibly of all time it just uh when into the spider-verse dropped i took my kids it was a magical moment they were too young to really figure out what was going on but we had so much fun with it and then since they've watched it on streaming and blu-ray repeatedly and we were all so excited to go see the second one. And, you know, sequelitis is a thing. We all know it's it's hard sometimes to live up to the original and to live up to the hype and the weight and everything like that. And it just, it nailed it. And then leaving on such a cliffhanger. I love that. I love that when you know 100% it's going to happen, like there will be another one. And they le and it's, it's a full on, you know, Star Wars style. It will be continued from this very moment kind of thing. I just, I adored it. I adored everything about it. I adored all of the references and I often I'm not a super reference -y kind of guy because sometimes it's lost on me. Sometimes I find that it takes away from the actual story is just trying to figure out all the Easter eggs and all that. But there's there's thousands in this one and it makes it all the richer for it. So I was just so very, very happy with how uh, Across the Spider-Verse turned out. Okay, before we go too much farther with that one, I have not seen either yet. What? what? I know. <laughs> So, yes, I know. Okay, See? I'm getting the beaten stick. I'll be over in a second. Hold on. Yeah, I'm getting my shillelagh. <laughs> <laughs> I ruined the show in the first two minutes. <laughs> well, <laughs> good. Okay, so I mean, show. luckily that was a pretty spoiler free, I think. Yes. Uh, uh, but yeah, it, yeah, well, Larry, this is your next thing that you have to do is watch both of them. They're amazing. So they are on the agenda for this weekend. Like I've actually said to my wife, I've marked them both because they're both streaming. I'm going to watch both this weekend because my son is just on the verge of disowning me for not having seen either <laughs> one so of them. So good. Yeah. So good. So I, I need to, I just, I need to pull up my socks and <laughs> turn on the TV. So <laughs> anyway, no spoilers. We can talk more about it, but just keep in mind, 
no spoilers. You won't have a whole <laughs> lot of input, I guess. Yeah, no, I mean, that's 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 what I've got for it, really. I, I can't say enough good things about it and how much it, it made me feel, you know, as, as a lot of these geeky things do, it makes you feel like a kid again and that magic of looking so forward to something like that. And, you know, growing up, I was a Spider-Man fan. I wouldn't say the biggest Spider-Man fan. I've always liked the shows and everything. But this is just, it's turned me into such a huge Miles Morales fan and every, like everything that they did was perfect. Yeah, it's it's so good. I don't know how how you haven't seen it. Neil, have you seen it? Oh, yes. Yep. It's pure art. Pure art. I was yes, going to say is. something, but I didn't want to spoil anything. So I'll ask, I'll ask Ben what he thought of a certain scene later. But but yeah, no, it's it's definitely one of the best sequels of the year, maybe of all time. All right. So next, uh, let's go to uh, Larry. What's your movie? Okay, well, I don't know if I can give that much hype to anything <laughs> that I say now. <laughs> all right. So um, as we all know, because I've talked about this multiple times in podcasts, I'm a massive Godzilla fan. I love, I love the monsters. I love the big old timey uh, ba- rubber suit battles. Um, so my hit this year, of course, was Godzilla minus one. Um, it was uh, not only my hit, but my favorite movie of the year. Like it just, it just blew me away. I, I mean, I knew because this is Toho Company, uh, a, pro- a Toho Company product. Again, it wasn't, uh, um, you know, a Hollywood production. It's not part of the monster verse, the new monster verse that um, is coming out of Hollywood. This was going back to its roots, and it 100% went back to its roots. So this was, for me, not only the best movie of the year, but one of the best, if not the best, Godzilla movies that's ever come out. Um, I just thought it had all the elements of what I love about Godzilla and I won't, it's, it's still in theaters. People may not have seen it, so I won't spoil too much about it, but it just, it felt like those 1960s slash seventies era Godzillas. Uh, It was, and, and on top of that, it was a fantastic human story. Like the people, the human characters that were involved in this were as compelling as the monster. Um, and that's rare in any Godzilla movie for the human characters. Usually you're just kind of wanting that's the, the human storyline to move along, <laughs> get out of the way. Get and fried. Get, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> get to more, get to more rubber suit monster fighting. Uh, but in this case, it was they were so it was so compelling. Uh, like there were there were tears in my eyes on more than one occasion uh in this movie. And that's I mean, for a Godzilla movie, come on, that's not even a thing. So yeah, uh, 100% Godzilla minus one. And okay, I, I won't say anymore. Uh, I'll save more f- for later. But yes, 100% Godzilla minus one, big hit of 2023. I'm uh, I'm looking forward to seeing it again, honestly. I, I am also a giant, like unabashed Godzilla fan. I love it. And um, again, yeah, I'd heard nothing but great things. My expectations were outrageously high and it still exceeded them in so many ways. And it is Again, I, I I don't make it to the movies as much as I'd like, but that's one that I want to go see again before it's off the big screen because it is so much richer on the big screen. I know then like it's that whole immersive experience, even in an art house theater, you know, the Highlands showing it in London right now. And I want to go back to see it there because I, it's, it would it'd be a perfect experience for sure. Absolutely. And and one of the cool uh, things that they're doing with it, it's a little bit of a look forward to to this year, which we're going to talk about later, but it's still in context with this. So um, they're re-releasing it, at least in Japan for now, in black and white. Um, oh, cool. It's really going to have the feel of the original uh, Godzilla movie from 1953 or 54. Um, and, and that, I think, is going to be outstanding, too. Like, usually, you know, when you know, a black and white movie, you're kind of like, ah, oh, yeah, I'm, you know, it's kind of cool and it's neat and everything. But this, I think will just add another level of authenticity to it. So I'm, I'm really excited. I'm really hoping that it comes to North America. I think right now they're talking about it just being released in Japan. Um, have you heard differently? Well, no, I was just thinking the trajectory of this whole movie, I think that they would be crazy not to because oh, yeah. it went from a couple of hundred theaters in North America to thousands. And, and like it, it went wide release because of the demand for it. So I think that, you know, the success that it's brought, we see movies re-released all the time, like Disney's re-releasing all their Disney Plus streamers over the pandemic era, you know, like, I think that it'll be an easy decision to bring that black and white one back. Some theaters I've noticed in Ontario never carried it in its initial debut, uh, same with some other foreign films that got a lot of a critical acclaim. And the idea is that, well, people don't want to go to the movies and read subtitles, I guess, it's like the tickets don't sell, but because of the hype now, because of 
everyone's saying how much they love it, right? And, and a bunch of other movies too. A lot of these foreign movies are finally getting shown in certain cities. Mm -hmm. Even here in Ontario, certain cities did not show any foreign movies uh, because they didn't think it was going to sell. But the hype, I hope, will sell it now. And it's more than just your average Godzilla movie. I mean, you know, the Brian Cranston one was okay, but this one really, like Larry said, made us really care about the characters. So two thumbs up for me, for sure. Yeah, two. Big thumbs up. I, I'm, I'm assuming Godzilla's in it. Like at some <laughs> point. Unlike well, the 2014 I, Brian Cranston thanks, one. Thanks for does, spoiling yeah. it, guys. <laughs> thanks for spoiling it for me. But, it's uh, actually, but uh, three, they just disguised it. It's actually Pacific Rim 3. And they just, <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> no. Very, very good. The director, the writer, and the visual effects guy is all the same guy. So, like, what a master. Passion yeah, project, awesome. right? Yeah. Yeah. I can't wait. So good. Uh, Neil, I'm going to say the movie that I don't think anyone else will say um, because it seems to have hit me a, a lot more personally than some other uh, movies. It's another Japanese film, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and it is The Boy and the Heron, the final masterpiece from, uh, supposedly final masterpiece from uh, Hayao Miyazaki um, from Studio Ghibli, as we all know, all their films, Spirited Away and Princess Mononoke. And this one's just as good as anything they've ever done on an emotional level. This movie was like Across the Spider-Verse, kind of in a way where it's it's pure art at times. There's things that happen on the screen that emote emotions and it gets the emotions out of the audience. It's a lesson for kids. It's based on a, an original story called How Do You Live, which is about dealing with something bad that happens. Little boy's mother gets killed in World War II. He feels like he could have saved her. He's got PTSD. He's you know going crazy with grief and, and uh, a malice and he goes through this cathartic process into this fantasy land that this heron it's not really a heron and that's not a spoiler it's in the trailer you know um <laughs> not really a heron but this heron shows him the way to getting over uh what happens to move on that the, the whole it's just a brilliant lesson for children and for everyone quite frankly dealing with with grief and um and, and moving on so the boy and the heron definitely as good as any movie i saw in 2023 well, awesome. and I, I feel like um, it may actually uh, take the Oscar this year for Best Animated. I had thought that it might have been Spider-Verse, but yeah. the more I hear about it, the more I see award ceremonies, the more I'm thinking that might be the movie of the year. Yeah, I hold slight resentment because I don't blame them for making that pick, <laughs> but I was hoping <laughs> that Spider-Verse would win. Yeah. Yeah. Spider-Verse is fantastic. It's really fast. Paced. It's a much yeah. faster paced movie than The Boy and the Heron. Some people, they go into it not knowing what to expect. And that's a good thing because it kind of, you know, it reveals itself to you and what it means to you. So I won't say any more about it, but definitely see The Boy and the Heron and Across the Spider-Verse. You have both. So my my uh, hit of the year is one that uh, I'm only I'm only laughing because I just, like it re literally recently I saw it and I had avoided this movie the entire year because I thought it was going to be terrible. And it was <laughs> Bo is Afraid. Oh, my, yes. and, and so I it came out um Ari Aster like I love his stuff and I thought oh I can't wait to see this and then it bombed and I thought and I didn't hear a lot of good things about it so I and I knew it was like three hours and a half or whatever so I was sort of avoiding it so I finally watched it thinking oh this might be my worst movie of the year and I loved it I couldn't <laughs> get enough of this movie start to finish it went so quickly and it was just I was into every little piece of this movie. I don't know, like Joaquin Phoenix, who sometimes I like, sometimes I don't, was amazing in this. Like I couldn't get enough of it, like from start to finish. Like, I don't know if you guys have seen it. I'm not sure. It's on the list. I haven't found a place where I don't have to pay for it to uh, watch it. And <laughs> I'm waiting on one it's of those streaming, streaming services. It's streaming now, I think. On, uh, on Prime. It, uh, yeah, Prime. Is it on Prime? Yes, and I and I just discovered that like a day or two ago. I was flipping by and was like, "Oh, there it is!" Because Loop, I had the exact same experience. I'm I'm a huge Ari Aster fan, yep. love his work, and I was so excited for this thing. And I and I really like uh, um, Joaquin Phoenix. So I thought, well, this is a perfect combination. But then the reviews started coming out, and they were really pretty negative. And I thought, ah, that's a long movie to sit through if it's not going to be good. So yeah. I put it off, put it off, put it off, and uh, then it disappeared. I'll tell you this: it is so weird and so bizarre that you'll be like what is going on in this but at the same time it's like you're on the edge of your seat throughout it because it really is a journey and that's what they call it and he did get nominated for a golden globe so obviously something was done right in it like it wasn't completely ignored uh mm -hmm. but it was it's like to me is like as good as any of his other movies it's crazy it's not like a horror movie but it's got horror elements in it but okay. psychological horror elements so it's definitely worth seeing it's really really cool I think there is something to be said for a movie that's not, you know, uh, a critical hit 
and not maybe it could be a flop. There are several reasons that it was a flop. There are many flops that are excellent movies, but if there is definitely a group of people, and I think that we're all among that group that can still appreciate a weird piece of cinema, you know, and mm -hmm. maybe everybody expected it to be odd. And I think, and I haven't seen it, but I know that I think it was, it was too much for a lot of critics and Hey, I've got no problem too much. <laughs> in yeah, many ways. It's a, it is a lot. It was a lot going yeah. on in it. And you're like, I don't know what's happening half the time in this, but it's, it's just compelling. It's just very compelling. And Joaquin Phoenix is just amazing in it. Like he's just, I was blown away by it actually, to be honest. So I don't know. It was so cool. Um, I just want to bring up, uh, so now that we've all done our, our top pick, I need to give an honorable mention Okay. Uh, because, because I, 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 I went back and forth between this one and uh, Godzilla, quite honestly, as my number one movie of the year, but I had to give the love to Vink to, to uh, Godzilla, but um, poor things. Uh, which just came out uh, a few weeks ago, just just under the wire, so it could be nominated for all the uh, all the award shows, yeah. um, is phenomenal. It is l by far the most original uh, uh, movie that you'll see in the this well going forward. <laughs> um, yeah. Even though it's based on a, a book, it's I mean it's not original, it's not original an original concept, but the storytelling, the way it's shot um visually it's it was i was not prepared <laughs> the the trailer does not prepare you for what you end up seeing um did you see it neil i did and uh yeah. i'm glad you brought it up because speaking of movies that kind of like split the audience and split the critics in some ways like a lot of critics love poor things yeah. but a lot of people that i when i saw the movie there was a lot of people that were like disgusted because oh, this yeah. is obviously the hard r rated movie right it's it's hard it's kind of a mix between Frankenstein and Barbie, if you think about it. Because it's you know, Frankenstein, Barbie, and porn. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, it's a pretty, uh, yeah. And Mark Ruffalo plays the greatest jerk I've ever seen, I think. You know, I saw Saltburn recently and I really enjoyed it. But so much of the hype around it involved how gross it is in some of the scenes. And poor things I've I've heard from some people how like overtly sexual it is, but that's not the main thing you're getting from it. Like all the reviews, they talk about how beautiful it is and how transcendent it is in so many ways, but it's not like it it's not the the sexuality is not the focus of the movie. There's nothing gratuitous. Like it's not it's not done for shock value. It's it is definitely part of the story and it's mm -hmm. part of Emma Stone's character's growth um and her experiences and it so it makes sense it's just very there <laughs> like it's just very but but for her it's just very matter of fact like it's just something that happens so it's not like it's shocking i mean it's shocking because if you don't expect it it's shocking and if you're with your wife and your son it's shocking <laughs> if i went if i went by myself i probably would have had a bit of a different experience because it wouldn't i wouldn't have been i wouldn't have felt so badly for my wife <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but she actually enjoyed it like she did she quite enjoyed the movie she was it really it is quite a thing so yeah i that was that was teetering on the edge of my of my top movie of the year so i wanted to give it a, a little bit of a mention right. uh right. just because it people should see it yeah, so no poor things is larry's miss of the year okay we'll move on what? to uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right so we're gonna go to misses now and we'll start with neil okay so like the only movie i went to see that you know got bad reviews and i went to see it anyway <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> was the marvels um, so i know there's like a handful of big franchise uh movies that people could say was their miss of the year because there's a lot of a lot of hate for superhero movies this year you know a lot of mediocre superhero movies um but disney and marvel they they were disney and marvel dc and marvel i should say they you know they were both kind of like i don't know about this one you know every time i watched a, a comic book movie this year i was except for maybe guardians of the galaxy 3 and across the spider verse those are the only two really good superhero movies this year um so the marvels was bad why was the marvels bad well i watched this movie and i just went they didn't care about really anything and it was kind of like if you like the first captain marvel which i didn't but if you like that movie you're going to get half of that here, even though there's more characters, even though the actress that played Kamala Khan was good. The actress that played uh, Monica Rambeau was really good. You know, I just, this movie was just completely empty and void. And most important rule of, of superhero action adventure, you know, James Bond kind of movies is that the movie is usually only as good as how cool the villain is. You know, it's like, oh, wow, we got Thanos or we got, you know, whoever. Wow, great villains. The Joker, wow, best villain ever. 
this woman, I don't even remember her character's name, but she's like one of the three <laughs> leaders, and she's like she's like the new Ronan the Accuser. She's taken over for him, and I just didn't care at all. Everything fell flat. All the jokes, everything in this movie fell flat. So there's your answer. the The worst movie I saw that I you know spent my time watching <laughs> was the Marvels. Yeah, out of all out of a year of bad superhero movies, it was the worst. I liked all the Marvel movies this year. I will put that out there, but. I, I understand where you're coming from. I think the problem with Marvel this year is the uh, um, it's it, they're too big. Like the movies are like, there's these worlds they're trying to create and it's too visually annoying, like to watch. Like, I just want something simple and it's like, and they're, and they're just getting too crazy with like the worlds they go to and people singing and whatever they were doing there. It was just, I felt it was just all, too much. And it was like, and again, the focus went away from the characters and went to like all these crazy places that they're going. And I, the world became the story as opposed to the characters. So I see what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. I mean, the, you want a good, simple superhero movie that bombed would be blue beetle. I, I got to like, a little bit defend it just a little bit because it's not a great movie but it's not a bad movie i thought it was fun it was fun i thought that was, movie was actually quite fun yeah but there you go there's a simple story about a hero who doesn't want to be a hero you know he's chosen to be this hero and it's kind of like venom in that way a little bit i guess but um it's more about family and it's about comic relief george lopez was really funny in the movie and there was good effects and susan sarandon was a good bad guy and it's like we've got everything here why didn't anybody go to the theater for this because nobody knows who the hell blue beetle is i guess yeah. Um, but anyway, that's just an example of like a simple superhero story that is not maybe the best, but still better than the Marvels by light years. <laughs> it's crazy to think, but you know, in 2008, not a lot of people knew who Iron Man was. I think that there's just such a burnout of, of superhero movies. I remember saying probably four or five years ago, man, what a time to be a comic book fan and what a time to be like a movie fan. Cause every world's colliding and all these great, fantastic movies are coming out. And I mean, it's it's worn out its welcome in a lot of ways, I think. I don't know, honestly, like I said, I haven't seen a lot of movies in theaters. I'm not sure the last superhero movie outside of Spider-Man that I went to, like I went out of my way to see. Guardian 3 was one of them, but I haven't seen a lot. And this is coming from the guy who was all caught up, you know, right up until uh, after, Infin or after Endgame and all that. I was catching up and then it just started losing me after a while. I think that they forgot uh how to make the movies and just that they needed to make the movies yeah yeah i think that that was the problem is that they just were cranking them out it became a factory <laughs> you know i mean with the right around when disney took over <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you know it really <laughs> it did it, and i think and i think that is the problem and i think that it's the same situation with dc um with the dceu which thankfully is finished um, but it was the same situation. They were cranking out these movies. They didn't really seem to have a plan, uh, but they had to compete. So let's get them out there. And they, the quality dropped significantly and people just stopped going and the, the interest is waning and it's, it's hurt the, 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 um, superhero genre across the board. Yeah, you know? They need a break like star Wars movies yes. taking a break. Yeah. Time for a break with superhero Marvel movies, I think. I think so. I think I, I absolutely think so. All right. Well, my next pick uh, for Miss is uh, one. I don't know. Some people may disagree with this one, but it, it, mine is Asteroid City, is, uh, oh! which has like a science fiction sort of theme to it. Yeah. I, I, when I first saw it, I thought, oh, this is this is great. But I don't know. I saw it again. I, and then I was like, this movie's too much. It's like, I think Wes Anderson's trying to like spoof himself. Like, is he's becoming Wes Anderson? Like, if that makes sense. Like, yeah. it's, it it's, there was, to me, there was very little story there and too much visual, too much sub or too much style over substance. And I, I don't know, I think Wes Anderson needs to pull back a little bit because I think that's as far as I can take Wes Anderson. Like, I just found <laughs> that, 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 like the, the, the stilted performances, the weird sort of like, like bizarre performances. Like I just, I'm, I'm bored of it. And I, and I found this movie too much. I, I agree in that it's a miss. It's not, uh, it's not my least, least favorite, but it's a miss in that I, I wanted it to be one of my most favorite, you know, like I, I, I found the similar kind of with French dispatch. It sort of started losing me a little bit. Cause it was, again, there was the substance wasn't quite there. The short story kind of aspect of it was, was cool, but yeah, asteroid city. I only watched it a couple of weeks ago and my wife fell asleep probably about 15 minutes in. She knows what she's getting into with a Wes Anderson movie, but I love, I, I have, I've been a Wes Anderson film uh, fan since bottle rocket and have loved all of his movies. And I'm starting similar to the Marvel stuff, right? Like it's just, it's this, it's kind of hitting the same notes at the same points and that sort of thing. But 
still enjoyable. It's just not as unique and different as it was, you know, 20 plus years ago. Yeah. I, I didn't hate it. I just, I found it was like, okay, let's try something a little different. Like I just found it was too, like his weirdness of the movie is it's too much and it doesn't, it's not connecting with me at all. The characters are, uh, are, are kind of self-involved and they kind of self parody themselves because they're kind of like, kind of like Seinfeld characters where you're like, you want to watch these characters, but you wouldn't necessarily want to be them. You know, like they're kind of obnoxious. They're kind of full of themselves in their own little world. And yet yeah. that's just like the play. Like that's just- I was going to say double it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the story within the story and then within the story, right? So I liked Asteroid City. I've been a fan of Wes Anderson myself as, as well a long time since Rushmore and all that. But, um, you know, I thought that it was really the performances and the presentation and, and just how it all came together overall. I thought it was very clever. Um, but I totally get some people not not digging it because the characters aren't that likable. And, you know, it, it's, it can be a story that's hard to follow. It's certainly not a movie you look at your phone and then go, what happened? You know, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, not that you should do that in the theater anyway. But uh, I, I just found the style was too much. Like I found like, like I understand his style, like the visually and everything else. I just it was like, OK, like it's like it's too much. It's just too it's, it's, it's almost like trying too hard to be himself like or something like it was just there was no connection for me with anything in that movie like it was kind of bizarre see i i actually really i did see it twice in the theater um and i i'm a i'm a huge wes anderson fan as well um i totally get that it's sort of becoming repetitive like it's becoming you know exactly what you're going to get when you go but I, there's something about his movies that still stands apart from every other movie that you're going to see in the theater his symmetry, like the way he shoots, everything is symmetrical. Everything is sort of his color palettes. Um, everything is very clean, I find, <laughs> with with his movies. They, there is still a distinctive look. So, you know, I mean, it may be, if you look at all of his movies together, if you're watching them all together, you would, I think you could see like a repetition and you could kind of become a little bit bored. But when you're watching an, an individual uh, Wes Anderson movie in the you know pantheon of other movies that are out at the time it will still stand apart because it doesn't look anything like anything else um so i i enjoyed it because it up uh, because of the aesthetic like i actually still really like the wes anderson aesthetic but i do like neil said i do understand how at this point people are like okay let's maybe try something different <laughs> maybe yeah. try a horror movie next time <laughs> or you know and his, his movies are beautiful like like i've never like a, as a director he's definitely got a, a, a vision and it's it, and they're they're cool movies like but it's like any director that has a, a certain style like a david lynch or whoever you either like no. them or you don't but i i do like wes anderson i just found this movie a little like self-serving i guess is a is the better way to say it and does it have anything to do with its recency beyond? Oh, see, he just lost You really offended him with that, I guess. He, <laughs> <laughs> he just dropped out. out. He's gone. <laughs> I did like the aesthetic of the screen, so I got rid of yes. him. So <laughs> like, oh, 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 back. Get, it's symmetrical again. <laughs> Good. Yes. I like symmetry, Neil. You can't leave. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's not symmetrical anymore. <laughs> I need my symmetry. It's probably me, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, but I do uh, wonder if it's based on like it was pretty quick after um French Dispatch and generally many years between Wes Anderson movies. So those who love his movies kind of jones in for another fix on that. But it did seem fairly recent from French Dispatch, which was that early last year or was it maybe late 2021? I'm not sure, but I think it was two years. I, I was it, it was two years? years? Yeah. yeah. It it seemed like, you know, back in the Rushmore and Royal Tenenbaums and Steve's issue, there's like several years in between yeah. each one. So you kind of get, you're waiting for another one. And it was also much more, I don't want to say fresh, because I still, I, I really like him and I consider myself a huge fan of Wes Anderson, but I just do wonder if it, it's almost a little bit of burnout, perhaps. All right, Ben, what's yours? I'll make this quick because I know we've gone long on some of these. Expend four bulls. I hated it. Man, it was awful. Oh, I, God. Uh, you actually watched that? Yeah, I did. Well, I, I loved I Couldn't loved the first two. I really enjoyed the first I own the first two, so I shouldn't talk. <laughs> yeah. And you know, and those were like my wife and I are both big dumb action movie fans. So that was really great to see those. Third one, you know, watered down. That was kind of the messaging was just they tried to reach a broader audience by watering it down, making it PG-13, blah, blah, blah. I had low expectations given the fact that the only thing the trailer said was, we put blood back in. It's blood and swearing again. So it's R, you know, and that's really all they they did. But it was just, it was bad, bad. It was, it was cheesy in a way that the first even three 
weren't in that they they leaned into it but they didn't over the top go cheesy and this was just bad it was just it, it felt like a full-on cash in like the third one except worse somehow <laughs> oh god <laughs> is it is it done i haven't seen i've never seen them i'm not a, a huge fan of that sort of thing so the first right. two are fun the first two yeah. are definitely fun but yeah. is this was this the last one they or did they even who open? knows yeah they they all it was Maybe i don't think it was ever meant to be a big franchise the first one was just a big success fun to see all your favorite 80s action stars on the big screen at the same time they added a few people in number two it was still fun then they added a bunch of new like relatively unknown like not the stallones and schwarzeneggers you know that was kind of the new breed but and and then this one it was just no there was nothing really there so (laughs) yes it's likely done because it bombed too (laughs) yes Uh, a lot lot of talent wasted they could always add a, a five where the s is Exactly. Yeah. There, oh, there's mean, so many examples. You know, yeah, there's, so there's options for another don't, don't one. give them any any hints. <laughs> wait wait for six bendables. It'll be great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I gotta write this down. Hold on. <laughs> All right, Larry. What do you got? Uh, biggest miss for me was a movie that I was really, really excited about because the hype machine did its job and forced me to go to see the creator. Um, which was oh. Gareth Edwards uh, sort of the, the way they hyped it was it was his his Star Wars, essentially. Um, and so I thought, well, you know, Gareth Edwards, who made one of the best Star Wars movies ever, um, is now creating his own universe that, uh, you know, they were hyping to be like the next big thing. Um, and the trailers, of course, made it look epic and and just this this massive you know space adventure um and i was so excited to go and it was so dull (laughs) and it was it was just the character it was one of those movies where characters didn't behave the way they should um and that is always a, a movie killer uh for me when when characters should um behave or do things the way you expect normal people would and they don't because that wouldn't move the story along properly or what that's a lot of what happened visually it was it was quite amazing um so that i you know i i give him credit for creating a universe um but he just he just felt so flat with the character development and what they were doing i just i was just i was so disappointed coming out of that movie Big, big miss for me. It's crazy to show how much of a splash it was. I had to really cycle through the Rolodex of what the hell the creator was when you mentioned it. I, I know what you're <laughs> I, talking I about now, it. but it yeah. was not on my radar at all. Well, and it was only because of because it was Gareth Edwards. Yeah. Um, and and now I'm I, for whatever reason, I've totally blanked on his Star Wars movie. Rogue, Rogue One. One. Rogue One. Thank you. Yeah, because Rogue One was such like literally the Rogue One is is up there, you know, in the top three Star Wars movies for me. So I thought if he could do a space epic space adventure in the Star Wars universe, he could certainly create something brand new and do, you know, and so the the trailers just resonated and it was just, I was so disappointed. It was, and going full circle, he also directed the 2014 Godzilla. <laughs> that's right. He did. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, and I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of that too. I mean, maybe, maybe Rogue One was his one-off. I don't know. <laughs> I, I had a lot of I had a lot of hope in his in his follow up. I don't know if he's done one. I think I don't know if this was his movie, the, his first movie since Rogue One. I I honestly don't know. I didn't look. Was this the one with the AI? Godzilla and Kong? I think. Sorry, did he did do that Godzilla too? Godzilla versus Kong. Oh, he may have. I, I, that's quite possible. Um, but yeah, this was sorry. No, this wasn't a. Uh, this, sorry, was um, this the one with the, the little girl yes. was the. Is that the yes. one? Okay, I remember seeing yeah, the, the the previews a, for it, but it's essentially. Uh, um, the world has been overrun by uh, tech, like by by robots. It's 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 the Terminator. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> <It is. laughs> you know, Sky, Skynet has taken over. Is Will and... Smith in this at all? Is there like no. the uh... no? Uh, okay, I think so. No, but yeah, okay, that's essentially, that's essentially the plot. It's Skynet has taken over, and okay. and the world is is oh. overrun or is is been being run now by by androids. Um, it was uh, John David Washington, wasn't it? With yes. The... Yeah. But it's so, the human's yeah. fault. It was the human's <laughs> fault. <Yeah. laughs> but now, the androids aren't uh, aren't uh, uh, evil killers as the uh, T no. eight hundreds and stuff. Whereas so it's a little no, different no, that way. But... They're not. They're they're just self realized uh, entities now. <laughs> and 
you know, but they've taken over, but it's, you know, it's the humans are trying to take back their planet <laughs> is what it is. It's not, I guess, not the most original concept, but it just, I was so bored. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was just, yeah. Not I what I quick think. search and Gareth Edwards always done. He did he did monsters was his big first one in 2010, but he did Godzilla, right. then Rogue One, and then this one. So he's not he's well, that's a, it. No. big special effects guy, but as far as directing, that's all he's done. Interesting. So yeah, so Rogue One was was sort of a, a one-off for him. I don't know if I like I really <laughs> thought that he was gonna be the guy I was gonna follow from now on. Well, yeah, uh, no. But... <laughs> <laughs> I still love Rogue One. <laughs> 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 but all right, all right let's move from movies to the uh, small screen we're gonna go to hits for tv shows and larry you're jumping right in off the top on this one anytime mike flanagan does anything no, no. <laughs> <laughs> ben and i just literally lose our minds well in advance like like months and months in advance if there's even a even a hint that mike flanagan is up to something we're all about what's he gonna do and we're gonna we're gonna be there for him and uh, this year he launched Fall of the House of Usher. I just thought it was it was fantastic. I just I really really enjoyed this this series. I don't know that I would consider it his best. Um, I still think um, um, uh, Midnight Mass is probably his his best, uh, followed very closely by uh, Haunting of Hill House. Uh, but I I just it it literally it's it's an Edgar Allan Poe homage. Um, and every have you all seen it? Yeah, okay. Oh yeah. <laughs> you haven't seen it. Okay. I, well, I won't. I won't go too into too many details. But it, it's essentially an Edgar Allan Poe. It's his love of Edgar Allan Poe is just pours out into this into this uh, show, and um, and he like he's not hiding it. It's it's this is quite like this is a part of the show, um, and it's just it's just really cool the way he adapted so much of Edgar Allan Poe's work into this new story, and it was a and it was a complete story and a cohesive story that that took a number of different Edgar Allan Poe stories and put them all together to create this thing. I just thought it was a really clever idea and it was really, I thought it was really well executed. Now, having said that, it did get a little predictable. I mean, you kind of knew what was coming based on the Edgar Allan Poe story that was being depicted at the time, but it didn't matter to me. Um, it also had just, uh, just as a side note, the biggest jump scare I've ever experienced in my entire life. Literally, and I'm not even joking. <laughs> There's a scene that happens that I was not expecting. And I literally, like, there was air between me and the couch. I jumped so high <laughs> and literally yelled out loud. It was just, it was, and then laughed about it for about 10 minutes afterwards. But it just it and it was it was a, it scared me because the scene was so compelling i was so drawn into what was being said and what was happening that i just did not see this moment coming and when it did god it got me <laughs> and uh so you know that's i think that says a lot about uh the quality of this production and so i decided to put it right at the very top of my list this year nice all the all that i can add because i agree 100 percent to all of that is I didn't think I'd be such a fan of this huge trend of like eat the rich stuff that's going on right now, like White Lotus and like super rich having horrible things end up happening to them. But yes. man, Mike Flanagan nailed it. Like he did such a good job and we've seen it in all the headlines. It's it's Poe uh, mashed up with succession sort of thing. And it's such, so well done with amazing performances. The performances, as we said, like Henry Thomas's best thing he's likely ever done ever. and or will do. Because yeah. we love the guy. He's not the best actor. He's fun to watch in a lot of cases. But man, he's brilliant in this. Yeah. And Carla Gugino, all, Gugino is always amazing. Everybody does such a fantastic job. And uh, it was, yeah, that was definitely my... Uh, luckily, I did make sure I had some backups because I knew if you were first, you'd be taking it. <laughs> <laughs> Same here, same here. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> well, let, let's cleanse that before we get going on it. But uh, Neil, what was yours? I'm actually going to go with the uh, the surprising return of uh, Rick and Morty. Oh. So I don't know if you guys are Rick and Morty fans. I'm sure you know all about they're replacing the main lead actor and the reasons why and all that stuff. We won't get into that, but... Um, when I watched the beginning, I believe it was season seven, where they started with the new two new actors, one new Rick and one new Morty, where the previous guy did both. Um, I couldn't tell the damn difference. I'd watched it and I went, is this 
Justin, what's his name? Or is this somebody new? I don't know. I have to check the credits. And they said, oh, no Justin Roiland in the credits, so it must be new. I couldn't tell the difference. And the writing was still good, too. They actually came back a bit, you know, last season was just kind of okay. But this one is actually really funny, really interesting. They're going uh, way out um, with a lot of ideas, as they often do. Almost a miracle, because when something like this happens, and, you know, a big change like that, usually you can tell. You can't tell this time. And sometimes the story suffers and people are just kind of eh, not really into it that much. Ah, Rick and Morty's an old fad now from like 10 years ago or whatever. And it's like, no, they're actually doing really well. They're really hitting it out of the park. Uh, I'd say the same thing for the South Park specials too, but I won't go on too, too long. Um, mm. Yeah, Rick and Morty was like, just to me, was just surprisingly, hey, they, they're doing a great thing here. Like, wow, like, you know, they really didn't need, <laughs> they didn't need the original guy, I guess. Uh, but, but <laughs> Excellent. I loved it. That's a good yeah, I've never seen it. It's, it's always interested me, but I've never gotten around to watching it. But I, my um, brother-in-law is okay. a huge fan. So I, I hear about it. So for, through him. So <laughs> It's I'm I'm in the same boat. I'm very intrigued by Rick, Rick and Morty. I know about Pickle Rick, but I don't. I don't. <laughs> I have one watched, episode. You know. Yeah, I haven't watched any. <laughs> I haven't watched any of it. But I I feel like I should have. I feel like I missed out by not jumping on the wagon at the beginning and and watching it all the way along because it. I think it was something. It's something that I would really enjoy. Rick and Morty. They tend to have guest stars. You know, they've had like Keith David and other great, great actors and Christian Slater on in the past. This season, we get Hugh Jackman. You know, we get a whole bunch of cool. That's cool. Uh, cameos. So check it out. Excellent. All right. Uh, mine, mine was Fall of the House of Usher as well. That was my top pick this year. So good. Any, my thing is like, if it's a show that I can't stop watching and I have to get to the next episode, then it's like a top, a top show for me. And that was definitely one of them. I couldn't stop watching it. Um, so I'm going to go with my second choice, which was Gen V, which is the boys spinoff. I think, and uh, so if we forgo too far, I have not seen the boys. <laughs> so spoiler free. No. <laughs> you read the comics? No. <laughs> I can see why you haven't seen the boys, even though I get the beaten stick out right now for you. But um, the end. No, it's a uh, Gen V. I was a little reluctant because it's a spinoff of the boys, and I'm like, it seems like they're just trying to capitalize on it. I actually almost liked it, and I didn't say I liked it better, but it was. It was very tight. I thought the show, and I thought it was it was really well done. And I again, I couldn't stop watching it. I was like episode after episode, and then they went on like they're off for a few weeks, and then I was like right into the next next crop. So I I thought it was it was great as an add on to the boys. It was remarkably fresh for a spinoff of something that's already three seasons in too. You know, like generally you see spinoffs and they're taking what works with one and just swapping out characters and that kind of thing. And, and they do that to an extent, but I, I, I really enjoyed it too. And it was the quality of it is right up there with the boys. I'm, I'm actually quite surprised that between the four of us, nobody mentioned the last of us. Um, so I, I just want to give a little shout out to how good that show was. Oh, because maybe there's some dissension in the, in the ranks here. Well, ben, Ben hasn't okay. done his yet. I haven't made like, my pick yet. So oh that's, God, that's... sorry, Ben. <sighs> I forgot you were not. here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, go ahead. That happens to us pale guys. We're in <laughs> <laughs> blending into this ginger background. Yeah. Yeah, okay, Ben, you go on. What's your, what's your, what's your pick, uh, Ben? So my pick this year is a show called The Last of Us. Oh! No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> no, I really did. I, I love The Last of Us. I did. And we'll get to that in a second. But yeah. I wanted to go. Um, I think I may have done it last year again. But Only Murders in the Building. Again, with season oh. three now. I adore that show. It is a fun mystery. It's a fun, this time, leaning into the creation of a play. And I love that aspect. I love theater and all that sort of thing. So Martin Short has never, in the 37 years of my existence and the 60 plus of his, never stopped making me laugh. I think he's hilarious. <laughs> he's so good. I love Steve Martin. I, I've i I've actually started liking Selena Gomez from actively disliking her before it never <laughs> heard so. uh, I really, I, everything about the show works so, so well. And I've loved, and that's again, one of those, you have to wait a week in between. And I was, you know, front and center as soon as it drops, ready to watch it. I loved it. So okay, no, we, Larry, you can uh, go on about The Last of Us. Us. Yeah. <laughs> Go on about the last of us. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, now my I've been deflated. I don't really care. <laughs> no, because it was a year ago, right? Like there is a bit of recency bias. I think that happens in this sort of thing. It was January, 2023 that yeah. it dropped and it changed so many people's lives. And again, like, I mean, with Nick Offerman, just winning that Emmy for guest appearance, like such a specific Emmy that he won guest yes. appearance in a mini series or whatever it was, but 
Brilliant, brilliant. And I've said repeatedly that episode as a standalone outside of anything is a, a per, it's a 10 out of 10 for anything. Easily, easily one of the best single episodes of a TV series I think ever created. It yeah. was so heart wrenching and so painful and so beautiful. And it just, it had every element that made it, that makes good TV that one episode did. Um, and then it just continued from there. I just, I just, I really, really liked that show. That was a very close second for me. I, it reminded me a lot of walking dead. I am I, I like almost too much. So, and, and one of my possible picks for worst was walking dead, dead city. And I, uh, I just, I, that whole concept is just, I think Walking Dead beat it to like a dead horse. Like I, I, but I do, I did like that series a lot. There was a lot of great, the performances were great. And I just, it just started reminding me too much and I couldn't get the Walking Dead out of my head while, while well, watching it. I agree. It hit me at first like that. And then you kind of, it, it becomes its own, its own. Yeah, it, it totally did. hundred percent. Well, and that's interesting to say that because the very first episode I was out. I watched that first episode and it was so reminiscent of The Walking Dead. And I am so yeah. not a fan of The Walking Dead or I became not a fan of The Walking Dead that after that first episode, I went in and was talking to some coworkers and I said, I'm I'm out. Like, this is exactly like Walking Dead. They're treating this apocalypse like The Walking Dead did. And I'm and I'm done. And, I, and then, they, you know, I thought, well, I'll give it one more episode. And then they they did what Walking Dead didn't do. And they explained the reason behind things like the reason behind why the cities were destroyed because that yeah. was at one point i thought oh like the city like how would this how would buildings have collapsed <laughs> these are just zombies they're not like you know construction workers who are pulling you know iron bars out of <laughs> like i never understood that i never understood that in the walking dead how cities physically collapse but they ex they actually explained it in this episode in this series and there are a number of situations like that where they actually gave you reasons for things happening. And that's what I want. Like, I want to know why the, the you know, the cities look the way they do and the people were behaving the way they were. Um, and that's not what I got from Walking Dead. So that's what made me love this show is that they remembered to give you background and, and to give you context. And and the context has made the show for me. Putting it on my list to watch again. Yeah, totally. 100%. <laughs> It's a lot like the game. I wanted to say that the adaptation was very close to the video game. I've played oh, the yeah. video game. And, um, well, yeah, they'd really stretched out that Nick Ackerman episode. That's a very kind of brief scene in the game. But but overall, yeah, they did a really good job, like you said, Larry, of kind of explaining what it was. It was that um, that kind of fungus, the mushrooms. That would, it starts with a C. I forget the name of it. but Cordyceps. Cordyceps. Yeah, cordyceps. That's right. That's right. And it's like how it grows in the brain. And then after watching The Last of Us, I went and I watched a, a, a quick like YouTube documentary you know nat geo kind of a special and it was about these ants that kind yes. of wander off and then they contract this stuff and then you see it happening like things yeah. riding under their heads that's and you're crazy. like oh my god this could be real yes so. it's like a real thing like it's yes and that's part of the like as opposed to the walking dead where i mean i, I stopped watching the show so i don't know if they ever explained what the cause was but this is a thing like this is it could potentially be a thing. <laughs> so yes i that that added to the fear factor for me. Yeah. So I, I yeah I love it. All right, now that we're done with Lawrence's two picks, it gets like two <laughs> on each of these categories now. Um, we're <laughs> we're going to go to TV misses. Neil, we'll start with oh, you. Okay, I want to get specific on one episode here. Um, oh, nice. I was going to say uh, The Walking Dead spinoffs, but <laughs> they're just boring. <laughs> the one, the, the episode, uh, there's, okay, so Mandalorian season three, okay? Uh, I'm not like all these haters and Star Wars fans now that are just, they hate everything, it seems, on, on Facebook and stuff, YouTube, but... I got to point out this one episode. Mm -hmm. um, like, I like Bo-Katan, and I kind of like the story, and I like, you know, the, the way that it was going and everything. And then overall, the, sh the season was fine by me. I'm not slamming the whole season of Mandalorian Season 3, but the one episode with Jack Black and Lizzo and Christopher uh, Lloyd. Okay, I got, no, I got no problem with these people, of course. I love these people, but what are they doing in Star Wars? It just took me right out of it. You know, it's like one thing to get... A familiar face like okay Katie Sockoff is pretty familiar okay you know we get a few familiar faces here and there but they're known from like other sci-fi stuff and they're known for these kind of things when we get like you know a, a, a great comedic actor like Jack Black or we get a great talent like Lizzo or we get an awesome actor in Christopher Lloyd that everybody knows and loves but just seeing them it just to me it just 
it takes me right out of it. I'm like, I'm not watching the Mandalorian. I'm watching the cameo show. Yeah. I'm watching, like, like an entertainment tonight special on this or something. It seemed like it's just like you took me out of it. And over and on top of that, the episode was crap. The whole episode was like Look, stupid. Yeah. Like Christopher Lloyd's a filler. Yeah. It's terrible. Yeah. It was absolutely it terrible. So disappointing. Mm -hmm. um, just that one episode, though. But <laughs> it wasn't even one it, episode. As a series, I would say I actually watched all the way through both Walking Dead series, the, the Dead City and the Daryl Dixon, and I thought they were both so boring. Larry, you think the creator's boring? Try watching <laughs> this, man. Woo! So bored. But anyway, my pick is that one episode of Mandalorian season three. I, I have to I have to totally agree that that almost ruined the series for me that one episode and it was that was a Dallas Bryce Howard episode, uh, which made oh, it yeah. even worse because she has been an outstanding director in that series uh, up to that point. So when there was a Dallas Bryce Howard uh, episode coming up, I was so stoked. I was like, this is going to be fantastic, but it was your 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 uh, description as as a uh, as a cameo episode is so perfect because not only was were those celebrities in there but she was trying to build a new world someplace we hadn't seen but she populated it with literally every alien that we saw in the cantina in the in a new hope like she didn't even give us new aliens like there was like a, <laughs> there was like a greedo in there there was like literally every and and the 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 holy modes like the the band they were playing in there it was like it was like a best of star wars in this one episode but you can't do that if you're giving us a brand new planet like if you're giving us a new world that we've never seen before it needs to be brand new it's yeah. you know it's, it's like she took us to florida and all of the you know, all of the aliens <laughs> went to vacation there or something i don't know it was, it was just, eat already yeah <laughs> <laughs> it was just awful i was so disappointed in that episode like that like which crazy was the era of 10 like 8 to 10 episode seasons they're all such high budget. There's no timeline. They can release it whenever they want. Yeah. Have a filler episode like that. You know, it's not 26 weekly episodes that you have to get done. Yeah. It's yeah. when do it man. your own pace. Take a year, take a year and a half. Who cares? It'll come out. Everybody's going to watch it. But to yeah. have a filler episode like that's insane. Yeah. And, yeah. and not like and the not only Batman TV series where it's like, oh, who's the guest villain this week? Yeah. You know? Like <laughs> we're going to recognize him because it's Vincent Price or something. But this is like, yeah, it's just like, it, 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 does Jack Black and Lizzo being in this episode make people want to watch the mandalorian that aren't already watching like i don't think so so it seemed pointless but not yeah. only that they did things in the episode that didn't carry through for some reason lizzo crowned grogu as king or something or or <laughs> gave him some sort of royal title of course and what is that like she didn't even she had just met this little guy and all of a sudden she's now he's part of the royal family and then and then then that was it there was no follow up with that. Like he doesn't yeah. carry his royal title on through the rest of the universe. I was just like, "What is that's, happening?" That's what the new movie is going to be about, Lizzo uh, and Grogu. I'm yeah, King Grogu. So, yeah, <laughs> that sounds like a Godzilla monster. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, I, the, the only episode I thought was worse than that episode is the one with the with the nest, where the that thing steals the kid and puts him in a nest, and they had to go rescue him. Oh, oh, yeah. Like that was that episode was filler big time. I was like, this. Is, <laughs> What like they're like he's battling a bird? Like what's going on in this episode? Like that one I think was the worst episode, and then and then that other one for sure. But that was my personal Mandalorian opinion. Yep. <laughs> Mandalorian is what I like to call it. Mandalorian. <laughs> uh, it's ruined for all of us now. Yes. All right. I'll go next with mine. Um, right. I had to pick Secret Invasion on this oh. one. I, I sorry. I, Marvel needs to be in misses on all the categories, um, oh. but. <laughs> Secret Invasion, I was actually kind of excited about because it had the, you know, sort of a, a little bit more of a spy sort of thing. And and it was like, if you've read the comics with Secret Invasion, it's a much longer two-year storyline. This yeah. was like, they, they used I think, two movies to set this movie up with, with the scrolls, And it was terrible. Like, it was just, it, it, it was meaningless. Like, the thing in the comic was the reveal of all these superheroes that were taken over by scrolls. You're like, oh my God, spider Woman a, was a scroll this whole time. And, and you could kind of look back and see how they were directing things as the, as the, the scrolls taken over. This had none of it. Like, it was just, it was, I don't know. It was a useless series. I didn't think it was well done. I didn't think there was just, what was the point of doing it other than just to put the name Secret Invasion on it? I just didn't understand. Like Marvel's trying to grab all these like kind of really cool storylines from the comics and then 
quickly making them into movies and things. And I don't they they got to like let them breathe and they're not, they're just trying to like whip all this through. It's like through the machine. And I, I and now you know what, sir, I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Agreed. Agreed. A hundred percent. Yeah. That's the microcosm of Marvel, right? Exactly. As you said, loop is they, you know, we cared so much the first phase of these movies and everything. We love the characters and it, did we immediately? I don't know. I don't know that everybody loved Thor after the first Thor, but they eventually become to love Thor. And it's that sort of thing where they're like, they're hammering us with so much right now. And they're like, love these people right now. You gotta love them. You get invested. And that's it. And it, <laughs> they don't give you the time or like you said, the breathing room to actually really start caring. Girls are supposed to be bad guys, like all of them. And then there's this civil war, this rebellion, this mutiny by this one graphic, I think it was his name. Yeah. Yeah, oh, it's just it started off so well too. Like the first episode of Secret Invasion, I thought was really awesome, and then it just <laughs> down the yeah. slopes, you know. Like, oh my goodness, yeah, pretty pretty lame. And like you said, Matt, it was so much smaller. I mean, they couldn't do like all the Avengers and X Men and all these characters, maybe, but they really made it such a small thing. Just about uh, Nick Fury and um, Rhodey and and whoever else, you know. Yeah. yeah, it was it was kind of a waste of time. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> I'm glad I didn't waste my time on it. <laughs> <laughs> ben, what was your uh, miss of the year? I'm sure this could be another quick one because I I don't know if anybody saw it. I, I gave it a shot. I didn't watch the whole thing, but Velma, I uh, I tried. Oh yes, I, I and forgot about that one. I made sure to read up on a little bit about it today to make sure that I wasn't crossing any lines because controversial changing up some of the characters and a lot of people didn't like it and they didn't like it for the wrong reasons. I didn't even care about that. It was, it didn't, I, I didn't like it. I just, there was so much wrong about it and inexplicably it's coming back for season two and oh. you know, Mindy Kaling behind it. I like a lot of the stuff that Mindy Kaling's done. I think it's just kind of gone a little too, too over the top. And this one was just like, I'm a huge Scooby-Doo fan lifelong it's not sacred to me. They can do it. Like there's been so many crazy Scooby-Doo versions and all that. And it's fine. But this one was just the, the biggest problem I had with it wasn't funny. It wasn't entertaining. I just didn't, I didn't like it. I, I felt the same. I think I watched maybe two episodes of that. And I just, I personally, I, cause I'm a huge Scooby-Doo fan as well. I own the entire series. <laughs> I love Scooby-Doo. And I just felt like for some reason they chose not to have watched any of the original Scooby-Doo's. Like it just felt not in the spirit of Scooby-Doo at all. Like no. I, I, they, that, that's it, the biggest thing. Yeah, for sure. Just, I just felt like they, why didn't they just create something new? If they were going to go so far off the, off the uh, Scooby-Doo track, why not just create something new? Like this you just do a parody. Like, exactly. Yeah. Like you could have a separate version. There's been so many, you know, call it a ripoff, call it an homage, whatever you want, but this to, to put it under that whole canopy of Scooby Doo is just a shame. Yeah, I was and and Mindy Kaling. It was again, it was a letdown because I love uh, um, the Mindy Project. I like I like her on The Office. Like uh, she's, I, I'm a fan of of yeah. her work. Yeah. So I was really expecting a lot from this, uh, but it just I I completely. If you hadn't mentioned it, I would have completely forgotten that it even existed. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Ben. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Open up those old wounds. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Men in black thing that you know, yes. yeah. <laughs> for that. It's so bad. Well, speaking now, of terrible reactions, Larry, what was your miss? Oh this year? <laughs> excellent segue. Yeah, um, yeah, perfect. Okay. So uh so this is gonna be an interesting thing because you're gonna see a little bit of pat of, of a pattern in what I'm gonna discuss for the rest of the show. So I started out really high at the beginning of the show, oh, top-notch no. things. I'm going a little lower with my miss on TV, and uh, and I'm going to talk about Monarch Legend uh, Leg Legacy of Monsters. Oh, okay. I I went into this again because I'm a huge Godzilla fan, with super high hopes and super high expectations. And you know what? I mean, like we said at the beginning, misses don't necessarily mean it's the worst thing that we saw. It just yeah. didn't resonate. And this is the problem I'm that I that I have with this. It started out really really well like the first have you guys seen it no no but i remember you recommending that i watch it yeah, yeah same here i, I did yes <laughs> because the first well the first couple episodes are really good and it it starts um it's part of the the new monster verse so it's part of the hollywood uh interpretation of godzilla so 
it's not the Toho. Uh, it's not any of that. It's the it's the new MonsterVerse, and it actually starts right from uh, the new King Kong or the 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 recent King Kong movie, the one with John Goodman. Um, he actually is in the first episode. Oh, so it literally I mean. takes place. It starts there and continues. So that's the universe that this is part of. And I'm I have to say I'm not a huge fan of the new Godzilla movies uh, of the monster the new monster verse. I'm much more of a classic Godzilla guy <laughs> so the, oh. it started there but um the premise was really cool because this is essentially like an origin story it's 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 really where uh monarch uh which is the organization that monitors the monsters on earth began it's character driven it's not um monster driven so if you're going into this expecting to see godzilla a lot you're really not um, and the problem with that is that then you have these human stories that have to be compelling um, because you are going in to watch monster battles. But instead, you're getting what we all hated about the original Godzilla movies was the human stories. You wanted those to go away so you can see the monsters. That's sort of what this becomes. As of the taping of this podcast, uh, the final episode has not aired. Uh, it airs actually, we're taping this on January 11th. The actual episode, the finale airs on the 12th tomorrow. So I, I don't know how it's actually going to wrap up. And maybe you this- eat your words. What if it brings you right maybe, back? You become- it, it we might, can wait. We'll just wait but, until it I'll airs. I'll just sit here and wait. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Wrap all this. I, we'll start I, again I, in a couple of days. Yeah. <laughs> the problem is that at this point, I'm not overly enthusiastic about the ending. And okay. I should so that's that's why it's left me flat. Not the worst show I've ever seen, but it just it started out really, really well and it progressively got boring. All right, let's move on to the open category, which is it could be a movie, a show, a book, a comic book, like uh, video games, industry trends. So it's it basically anything that we haven't really covered um, or things maybe we have covered. So let's start with the hits and let's go to Ben. I am not a huge video game guy. I have a couple of games I really love a year, but this year and it's been my entire life, like this has been a part of my entire life. You guys can probably tell from here. Uh, I got it here. Oh, geez. <laughs> I got it there. Um, <laughs> Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom is one of the all-time greatest games ever made. And it's uh, it's a direct sequel to another one of the all-time greatest games ever made in Breath of the Wild. And, you know, for anybody, if this is out of your realm, it's what used to be like linear dungeons. You have to pass a level kind of thing. Breath of the Wild, they went super open world. So you did your own thing. And yet you're in a completely different world than you've ever seen before with Hyrule. And then what they did with this one is it is a direct sequel but they tripled it. It's a, It was what a giant open world was, and they tripled it. There's you go up, you go down, you go all over the place, and you. It, it, it's just incredible. I, I mean, for anybody out of uh, you know, if it's not on their radar, really hard to explain what makes it so special. But it's it was in again in every way. It was a perfect video game, and the way that they've able they've been able to swing you know the classicists who are like, oh, Legend of Zelda has never been the same since you don't have to beat impossible water temples. They, mm-hmm. They've really done something insane with, with these new games. And they said that they'll never go back to, you know, the old linear style because I think partly success, partly the creativity that allows you for it. It's also now what they've included with this new one is um, a way to like build your own things, whether it's your own weapons, your own vehicles, your That's own, cool. all these sorts of things that give you this opportunity to do that. And it's just, again, it's taking what was a 10 out of 10 game and now making it like a 12 out of 10 game because they've, <laughs> they've made so much and I, everybody was saying as it as it the trailers came out and the teasers they're like oh this looks like DLC for Breath of the Wild it looks like the exact same game and then people openly ate their words when the game came mm-hmm. out and saw how amazing it really is so um, just a great time to be a Zelda geek I love it were there ocarinas oh uh, no but there's music there's still music oh, there's okay. still some music that's always right. a big part of the games for sure okay fair enough. <laughs> 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 awesome neil what about you let's pick a category nobody might pick i don't know if you guys are even reading comic books anymore i mean i, don't know I still do them. are you okay yep. well okay mine is uh mine is really geeky um because it's a big crossover it's one of the most epic comic book crossovers of all time <laughs> and it is teenage mutant ninja turtles versus street fighter whoa oh wow where <laughs> You're not aware. I think it's IDW that put it out. I, I could be wrong, but um, I bought the first five issues, 
And I thought, okay, this is going to be, you know, silly or whatever. And it, it turned out the dialogue is actually really great, especially like Raphael and uh, and some of the some of the stranger Street Fighter characters like Zangief and you know, guys like that, um, and Bison, you know, uh, teaming up with Shredder. And uh, yeah, it's about I know it's, it sounds as like juvenile and as, as geeky as possible, really, right? But <laughs> imagine if they made a crossover animated. I would go animated a uh, film based on this. That would be fantastic. They did do a, a Ninja Turtles versus Batman, and that was a lot of fun, seeing Batman fight the Shredder and stuff. Um, it's just good. It's just good, good, easy to read. Like you'll read the comic in two seconds because it's just so entertaining. There's so much action, you know. Like Raphael and Chun Li, they get captured and they gotta get out. Are they gonna get out? Oh, no. <laughs> Obviously, you know. So it's not like the greatest writing of all time, but the art is really good, and I love the dialogue, and uh, I had a lot of fun with it and thought i would mention a comic book series since no one else probably will. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. awesome i love that. Yeah. that that is so like nostalgic both of those things together in one place that's huge i, I love that I, I this is totally flew under my radar i didn't even know it existed so that's that's really cool good call what a time to be a ninja turtles fan again yes. right like they're, they're, the products are coming out and they're so yeah. good Yes, multiple covers as well, so you can collect like six versions of it. <laughs> number one, that's two. awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> that's cool. Larry, what about you? Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna break tradition a little bit here and go with my hit and miss at the same time. Oh, okay, all right. Um, and that is the SAG after a writer strike. Uh, mm-hmm. We have to talk about it because that was a huge part of 2023. Yeah. Um, so, f- as a hit, uh, it was successful. Um, the writers, the actors managed to negotiate their terms and, and they made it through this and they are, they are better off for it. Um, and I think the world is better off for it. I think, you know, I mean, it, it took a, it took a long time getting there. Uh, it was like four months or something. Yeah, it was long, but, but they deserved what they got. I mean, especially the writers, the writers, I, I, I mean, I, I have to admit, I didn't really know much about a writer's, a Hollywood writer's career. Uh, before this but I mean the money they made was just pitiful for I mean nothing exists without the writers I mean it's just the the way that they had been treated was just abysmal it was just so so my the the hit is that they are finally getting their due Um, and so that I think was fantastic the miss was that it it essentially put a full stop on all of our pop culture exciting things <laughs> um right down to you know when we went to comic cons uh all through the year none of the celebrities who attended could speak about their projects old or new so yeah. we ended up attending a lot of uh panels where they were talking about their pets and their you know their passion for cooking and things like <laughs> that which is i mean it's interesting you get to know them as people uh but really you want to know about their their history their their pro- the project the stories yeah the inside stories and things exactly yeah. so i mean i was it was I think we managed to get one Comic-Con in there after the strike so that they we could hear about their stories. But up to that point, we just thought, I mean, and I had, uh, there were panels canceled. I I uh, had a panel with um, uh, Hayden Christensen at Fan Expo this year, and I was super excited to hear his insight and his stories, and he canceled. He, he didn't cancel his appearance. He was there, but he canceled his panel because he said, I don't have anything to talk about. Like, I mean, he doesn't have a huge, illustrious Hollywood career other than his Star Wars, and he wasn't allowed to talk about that. So he said, well, I'm just, I'm going to cancel. So it was just, it was disappointing that we lost all of those opportunities. Uh, so that's why it's my miss. But ultimately, it was for a good cause. And and we all understood that, and we supported what they were doing. Uh, it was just, you know, we we missed out on a lot of and they missed out on a lot of opportunities that were coming uh, because of what they had to do. <laughs> so that's, yeah. my, that's my hit and miss. Yeah. I, I, like, I like how you combine them. Yeah, yeah that's good. <laughs> I, <love it. laughs> I went to uh, Ottawa Comic Con this year, and Ottawa Comic Con had the same situation, right? They couldn't talk about their work and stuff. Uh, Melinda Clark, who's a great actress, and also Emily Swallow from The Mandalorian, they both th- did a great job ex- of explaining why they can't you know, talk about this and what they can talk about. It's okay. Well, you can talk about me as an actor. What inspired you to be an actor? Well, okay, we can do that. Well, I just can't talk about this episode of Mandalorian or whatever. Okay, fine. Um, 
Casper Van Dien and his daughter Grace from Stranger Things, um, they did a panel and, and it was just like you said, they, they did a panel about these bizarre questions. Uh, Casper's favorite question was, who's your favorite golden girl? <laughs> 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 Rupa Clanahan, Blanche, yeah. because he worked with her. So when uh, the uh, writer strike happened in two thousand and eight, that was the. Uh, I, I don't think that Walmart five dollar bins existed before that, because that's when they just started. They started filming all of these crap screenplays that they had just shelved. You know, it was stuff that yeah. already existed. So I'm really interested to see. That was also a different time of the um, the sheer volume of content was not being made as it is now. I feel like the industry in itself is about five times bigger than it was even 10 years ago. Oh yeah, for so sure. I, I'll be interested to see what the fallout, the the longer effects are going to be because we saw a bunch of, you know, and again, like Nicolas Cage and Bruce Willis, half of their career is these terrible movies that they filmed in those years because they wanted work and these were, they didn't have to pay writers for these awful movies that had already been written. So, but now I don't, I don't know if there is going to be much of a fallout. We're seeing 2024 has a huge slate 2025 you know, leaning into franchises, they've already got their whole next 10 years planned out or whatever. But I am interested in the smaller scale on what we're going to see if there's going to be more desperate attempts at making a buck based on losing these, you know, four or five months between writers and actors strike. Or if the fact that they both happen at the same time, maybe there is, maybe there's, maybe we're working far ahead enough that it's not going to make a huge splash. I don't know. I don't know. Well, I think part of the, part of the fallout was in the, the theater chains. I mean, yeah. for the longest time, they just didn't have content. Um, so, you know, theaters were running classic movies, which was fun and nice, but it wasn't bringing in money. Um, so I know that there were some theater chains that were, you know, struggling. Um, sure. And yeah. and I and I, I, I think that's a bit of a problem, <laughs> you know, that we didn't see coming and that they maybe they didn't see coming. But I, I mean, it, it's all impacted. Another of the impacts are... Things like um, Stranger Things, uh, Stranger Things 5 was delayed by, I don't know, a year, um, which means that all of those kids have now aged. Um, and, you know, so we're not going to get formative years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're not, we're not going to get the same type of season finale in that show that we would have had this strike these strikes not happened because they would have been closer in age to what they should have been. Yeah. So yeah. things like that. I mean, everything is. It's, I mean, the impacts, I think we're not seeing them so much now because the the product is back on the shelf, <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. we're able to go back to the theaters, all the movies are back and the slate, like you said, coming up is great. Um, but it's those little things that are still sort of hanging over our heads, you know, we're, we're waiting an, an, an awful lot longer for series to continue uh, than we than we would have. All right, I'll go to my hit, which is I don't think anyone's interested in it, but me. Um, but uh wrestling this year has been off the chart like if you're a wrestling fan with yeah. between wwe aw tna all japan like and people going back and forth cm punk's back like in the wwe who they never thought he'd come back because he basically told like vince mcmahon to f off <laughs> basically <laughs> back i mean it's it's a i would say right now is a golden age of wrestling like kind of mm -hmm. like the attitude era or your rock and wrestling era with hogan this right now, I think people won't appreciate it right now, but I think they're going to look back and go, this was a great era of wrestling. It's just exciting. There's like, there's the, they're selling out everywhere. Like, what is it? Uh, had um, WrestleMania had two nights of almost a hundred thousand people each night. Like it's, it's insane. Like the wrestling community is it, like, can't get enough. And it's, it's, it's a fun to be a wrestling fan right now. And I love it. I love every second of it. That's pretty cool. I know, I know Larry's a huge wrestling fan, so he'll he'll back me up on this. But well, now having said that, I just maybe a week ago or two weeks ago watched an entire documentary on uh um WrestleMania one. Oh yeah, it's that's good. That, I've seen that. That was my era of wrestling, was the whole Hulk Hogan uh junkyard dog. That that was my era. So I did watch that and I loved it. I was so it was so nostalgic and so awesome. So yeah, I do I do like wrestling up to a point. <laughs> to about 89 channel a and e right has done a, a really good job of yeah. providing um documentaries and other shows like uh, wwe's most wanted treasures or whatever yes. and a lot oh of yeah yeah broken skull sessions interviews and stuff and i've always said like i haven't watched wrestling like in a long time really on a regular basis i i, I barely know who's there anymore um but 
I, I do got to say that the behind the scenes interviews, um, people like The Undertaker, Mark Calloway, you should subscribe to his YouTube channel because he does the best interviews. He tells oh, the he's, great He's story. great. Now that he's not in character anymore, you can kind of yeah. just talk freely about what he did, which is really cool. Because yeah. I was a guy that stayed in character all the time. Like he didn't, he didn't like to break it. And it was, uh, it was very cool. But the, uh, I just, there's so much, like you're saying, like on A&E, there's so much material if you're a, a fan of wrestling, like between, like when you guys are playing video games, I'm watching wrestling. Like I yeah. tape, <laughs> I, I bet like 14 hours of wrestling a week, if not more, almost close to 20 a week. I don't watch it all in full, but I'm yeah. always up on what's going on. And I, I've, I've been a wrestling fan since a kid and I've never left it. And I, I love it more than ever. So that's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> and that's why I like wrestling. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'll go to my, my hit just because I'm already still talking or my miss story in the same category. And it's the Marvel universe. We've talked a little bit about it. We've it's there's Marvel has not had a good year and it's not and uh, like the movies again, too complicated. This multiverse is way, way too complicated unless you're like a, a fan of comics. I find um, and have some sort of idea. Loki was the only thing to me that really did it well this year. And I thought Loki was a great series. But other than that, the rest, I, I don't know. It's like they're all entertaining in some way, shape or form. But again, as a whole, like a lot of the movies were just like had no soul to them. And uh, and also with the whole Jonathan Majors issue that they've had, that's like Marvel's in trouble right now. I, I know they can pull it back together. We were talking, Larry and I, about Echo, which I loved. Mm -hmm. um hopefully they'll start to pull it back together and really get a new plan going and figure this out because i want to see these guys on screen as well <laughs> sooner than later so in the x-men so hopefully that'll all happen but it just was not a good year for marvel and unfortunately and hopefully they can look at what they've done wrong fix it and come back for next year because what's the rush i think that's what it is yes. right is what's the rush we don't need to blast all out as, as quickly as possible ben i think you kind of nailed it when you said there's no timeline anymore it's not like in the old days where you had a series like Lost that every September you had to have a new series right. or a new season ready to go and you had to have 26 episodes and you had to, that's not the way it works anymore. You literally can wait two years. You can wait. I mean, Mad Men waited like four years between episodes or be between seasons or, I mean, that's, you know, we've come to accept that you're not going to get every September, you're not going to get the next season of your favorite show. It's going to come when it comes. And that's usually good. That's a good thing because you know that they're taking their time with it. You'll so, wait three years and then you'll watch it in a weekend. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, <it's not>. Exactly. <laughs> but at least it's going to be good for the most part. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, like take the time. There's no need to pump these things out. Like that's that's where fatigue happens. And that's what's going on is just slow it down. Like there's no, yeah. there's just no need for that. <laughs> Yeah, I know yeah. so many people have just like haven't caught up. Like they're like I'm caught up completely, but I know a lot of people who haven't seen half the stuff because it was just coming out so quick you can't keep up with it all. So yeah. And then it, it reminded me of much. um Neil could maybe back me up on this, but it reminded me of the CW DC, like the DC sort of TV oh, universe yeah. with the flash. And I used to watch Arrow, I used to watch The Flash, and then it just became too many shows that were all tied together and I couldn't keep up with them all. Like there was just too much volume of stuff. So well, I kind of I and then they had crossover episodes, which meant you had to have watched all yeah. of the Flash and all of the Green Arrow and all of the all of uh, or the Arrow, uh, all of that stuff. And that that's what makes it so difficult is that you've it's no longer entertainment; it's a job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's exactly yeah. what it is. It's, <laughs> you know, it's, it's something exhausting. Have, it is. It's something you feel you feel like you have to do. And that's what I was finding with the Marvel universe is that you know before any movie came out, you would always ask the person who had seen it, what do I need to have seen in order to understand what I'm going to be seeing? That's not the way it should work. <laughs> you shouldn't yeah. have to go back and do homework in order to <laughs> understand the next thing that's coming out. Like it just, you know, that's not how you, you um, build a fan base. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, you've got your fan base who will do that, but in order to build that fan base, you can't expect that they're going to go back and watch 11 years of, of uh content so that they'll understand this one next thing that comes out and that's i think what's i think that's the problem is that they're expected they they started that with the you know the all the way up till uh the end of end game um but it was great because that's all there was there were no tv shows it was just yeah. you know a, a movie or two every year and it was easy to keep on but top of but if you keep up with it all, you can be an obnoxious know-it-all, which I loved being. It's like, uh, I saw that true. one. If you haven't seen it. Um... <laughs> actually, guys, actually, 
I saw <laughs> yeah. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> Boy, yeah, way too many characters to care about. And then the characters that we did care about initially were just like, uh, we don't know what's going on with them. Like, okay, a couple of them are dead, but still it's like, well, what's going on with uh, Thor right now? Or what's going on with this character? It's like, we don't care. We don't have time. We got to introduce all these new characters. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah. But it, doesn't too much. it doesn't even matter if they're dead. They brought back Black Widow. <laughs> we're bringing back Robert Downey Jr. as Iron Man in something. Yeah. In the so, future. I don't know if it's a flashback or whatever, but they'll probably bring them back to life. You know, nobody in comics, nobody no. in the comics <laughs> would stay dead, right? They, except for except for Spider Man's Uncle Ben. That's the only one that stays. <laughs> he didn't have a superpower. superpower. But this is becoming as long as a Marvel Universe movie. So let's yes. move on to uh, <laughs> let's move on to Neil. Neil, what was your uh, your open category miss? I mean, I'm just going to riff off of what, what Loop was saying, just about superhero fatigue. You know, and I mean, D, not just Marvel, but DC as well, right? I'm not a big fan of the way that um, a lot of movies, nothing I could do about it, it's normal, but the way that that the world, you know, the commenters, the fanboys or whatever on social media, the way they respond to the announcement of any anything new, it seems like anything new that they don't already know about is automatically kind of, now I'm not going to give it a chance. Or some things are, it's like judging a book by its cover. Um, there's a lot of superhero movies this year that were just kind of like, okay like they're not that bad but people are like oh it's so bad oh my god it's the worst ever it's like <laughs> calm down you know like overreactions i guess is my <laughs> yeah yeah i miss you know for the year because that can really sink a movie that can really destroy a movie even just the idea that this movie is not going to be good um i'll give you a, an example and a non-superhero one because we talked enough about superheroes i guess but um uh dungeons and dragons honor among thieves this was a i movie. loved it yeah, right? I mean, it was yeah. pretty good. Yeah. But you watch the trailer and it's like, oh, a whole lot of love is playing in the background. And it's like a bunch of, it, it looks like, it looks lame. It looks like it's going to be really bad by the trailer, at least in my opinion. But yeah. that's how a lot of people react to the trailers or whatever. And they go, oh, this is going to be crap. I'm not watching this. I'm going to boycott this. And it's like, why? Like, give something a chance first, or at least wait for, you know, trusted movie critics you know, not Rotten Tomatoes audience score. Don't look at that. Look at, you know, your trusted critics, your favorite ones on social media. You know, I love like Victor Lucas and Oliver Harper and uh, Dan Merle and all these great um, critics that are just like me, just like all of us. We're all media trained, but we have good opinions and we don't just say something stinks because we think it stinks. You know, we're not some some troll online that goes, oh, it sucks because it sucks. Well, no, we can't. <laughs> it's, yeah. You have to explain, you know, like that's not a review, Roger Ebert. Come on, you know, you got to <laughs> and, and, and give details. Oh, I didn't like this character. I didn't like the way this happened. Oh, okay, great. This is a rip off of this and I didn't like this. Okay, good. And at least you're talking about it. Um, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. I don't know how you guys feel about this movie. I liked it. I liked it, it. It was trashed by, you know, most of the cool kids or whatever out there because it's not a great movie. I didn't think it was a bad movie. It was an okay swan song and we don't have to get into it. But the idea that that movie was so bad is like, no, just enough, you know, enough with the overreactions and stuff. It's plus it's the last Indiana Jones movie. He's an old man. You, you can't explain them. You can't, uh, sorry, you can't uh, blame them for pushing um, Phoebe Waller Bridge's character into the spotlight. And some people took that and um, just like in the South Park into the Pandaverse, you know, they make fun of this, where the fan, like Cartman basically is a representation of toxic fanboys. And he thinks like everything Kathleen Kennedy is bad and it's got this terrible agenda and she's evil and all this stuff now. And it's like that perfectly sums up, you know, nerd fanboys reaction. And that seems to be the narrative to Hollywood, all these comments online. Whereas, you know, I'm going to say real fans like us that actually go, okay, that part was good. And then, you know, the whole thing's not terrible. I, you know, you can find the positives in a movie that's just okay. But people yeah. just love to trash it. And obviously Hollywood's already been through a hard time this past year with so many layoffs and so many movies delayed and so many, so many billions lost, you know, because of the strikes. So it's like if Hollywood's in a recovery state, I think fans just need to be a little more forgiving and not so damn vicious you know, just at the idea of this movie. Oh, Dungeons and Dragons, that's going to suck. So nobody saw it. But then I watched it at home. Eh, fun movie. So I loved it. I saw the theater. I thought it was great. I thought it was fun. I played Dungeons and Dragons my whole, like, growing up. And I, even into my adulthood. And it was, it was bang on. It was fun. And that's what the game is. Like, it's, yeah, I never did. I don't know. It. But yeah. yeah, I mean, I could quote a million, like, examples. Like the Iron Claw, for example. Loop, you're a wrestling fan. I don't know if you saw the Iron Claw. But I did. But that movie was like it got a lot of good critical acclaim so i went to go see it and i liked it sad movie of course but i liked it and yet i try to tell my friends about it and they're like 
Oh, wrestling? It's a wrestling movie? No, I don't want to see that. That's wrestling. No, no, no. No, I'm too good for wrestling. No, no, no. <laughs> well, no, the, like, the funny part is the, re- the the best part of wrestling isn't the the wrestling. It's the it's the storylines and the people and the characters. That's the best part of it. And, the, and sometimes the backstage drama, like the real stuff going on, is also just as interesting. But there, there was a terrible Ric Flair in that. That's the only thing I'll say. Yes. <laughs> but other than that, the rest of it Ric Flair. I, I loved it. The rest of it, I loved. I just, the Ric Flair was a little off for me. Like the, the, <laughs> probably the most imitatable person in, on the planet. This person <laughs> couldn't yell it. I don't know why, but, but anyways. <laughs> Should have hired me. I could have done yeah, it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. All right, Ben, what about you? For me, now this is a hard one. Uh, I want to go broad and say streaming services in general, but for me, it's, it's the wiping of, of shows and, uh, and and movies and everything from existence because they can. So we've seen, you know, uh, Coyote versus Acme. There was a Scooby Doo holiday movie, uh, Cat or Batwoman, um, and a show called Shining Veil. Vale. They they dropped the second season of Shining Veil vale on December first, and then said they're taking it off of streaming December thirty first. It's actually mm-hmm. still available on Crave, which is good. But I have such problems with streaming now, and I I've been echoing what Christopher Nolan said in an acceptance speech a couple of weeks ago. He said, you know. When, when Oppenheimer drops, go out and get it on DVD because you'll never know where you can find it in the future other yeah. than on your shelf when you have it, you know? And I've had such struggles trying to find what I'm looking for. Years ago, I remember hyping up Clue from 1985. And I was like, I have a DVD buried somewhere of it. Wanted to watch it with some friends. Like that night, we wanted to watch it. I was like, oh, I saw it on wherever. Uh, let's say Prime. It's on Prime. Look it up. Not on Prime. Okay, well, let's go over to Netflix. Let's go over to grave let's go over to wherever 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 it's not available anywhere and last weekend i wanted to watch it again can't find it anywhere on streaming unless you're going to pay a rental price or that sort of thing through apple tv or 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 prime now prime with their 400 levels of what you can watch and not watch it's driving me crazy and as a you know fan of physical media in general luke you know this as a as a record guy as a dvd blu-ray guy all that sort of thing I've leaned into that so much. I was just saying before we started this, I was sick yesterday. I brought a stack of DVDs up to my room and watched a bunch of old Criterion movies and those things you can't find on streaming unless you're paying the Criterion streaming service thing. You know, Which I have, yeah. 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 <laughs> <Be> amazing. <laughs> that's, that, that's the thing, I'll, I'll, <laughs> sorry, I'll follow up with that because I'm watching Twin Peaks, the original series. Nowhere to be found anywhere and also, if you're looking for a movie, call Loop Busters because I probably have it and I have it. <laughs> so I've got I've got all the hits. I got all the hits you can if you ever want to borrow them. I'm the same way. My problem is my house doesn't have I don't have a spot to hold it all. So it's in boxes away. So I've got 1600 DVDs and Blu-rays and all that sort of thing. And it's, you know, it's it's almost as cumbersome now to go through all those boxes as it is to <laughs> yeah. try to find what streaming service it's on or pay for it. While you guys were chatting, I looked it up. Bo is Afraid is available on Prime for four ninety nine dollars because it's not a Prime show or a Prime thing. You have to pay for it. It's Paramount Plus or whatever it is. I don't know. But that's just that every, every single month, it seems like there's another tier that you have to pay for. We're also happy to cut cable and cut the cord. But now <laughs> it's not just Netflix. Now it's everybody has to have a streaming service. Mm-hmm. And there are, I think, some rumors that they're going to try to make more you know conglomerates of of everything in one service but they're going to charge you for it and if i'm spending this much on streaming services i'll go buy the five dollar dvd now at this point because i want to watch it again down the road so streaming has really gotten on my nerves this year more than any and it's because you know glutton of choice or whatever it is there's just far too many options and you don't know where your money should be going anymore it's so funny that you bring this up now because literally just last night for whatever reason, I had this urge to watch Sling Blade. I haven't watched Sling Blade in years, yep. and I was yep. like, it just felt like it just felt like the right night to watch Sling Blade. It was a, <laughs> it was literally the perfect movie for that night. Um, and I used to own it on DVD, but years ago I sold a lot of my DVDs when streaming started, and I was like, well, I don't need all of these because there's now that's their streaming. Netflix, service. yeah, yeah. I mean, I still have a huge. DVD and Blu-ray collection, but unfortunately that was one. It is nowhere. Like it was an Academy Award winning movie in 1996. 
Um, it is nowhere, and you can't even rent it. Like, yeah, I I went on. I thought, okay, well, I I'm, I want to watch this movie so badly that I will pay the five dollars and 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 watch it. It was it wasn't even available to rent. Yeah. Like it's gone. That's crazy. There's nowhere to. So I had I went on Amazon last night and ordered it. It'll be here tomorrow. There you go. Yeah, it's, it's wild. <laughs> now it's I'll good. have I'll have the Blu-ray of it and I'll put it on my shelf. But it, but it, exactly like things like that, like classics, like ones that you thought would never disappear from a streaming service. Are gone. Are going. They're gone. Yeah. I mean, because they're they're flooding their streaming services with their own original content. They have but to then, make not even that sometimes because they're canceling it too. Like they'll, well, they'll film it and then they're not even like and then they're like, nah, never mind. You know, it's just yeah. wild to me that I you know we've saw all the tweets and everything surrounding Coyote versus Acme, and it's like saying better than any of the uh, Space Jams, and it's like it's best Looney Tunes thing that's come out in forever. All this hype around a movie that possibly nobody will ever see just because they don't feel like putting it out on their on their streaming services it's bizarre yeah. you you I mean, really need to if you are into entertainment if you into movies you really need to be the master of your own collection <laughs> yeah. you can't rely on on finding the things you want be your own the... domain you're master of your own domain there literally <laughs> <laughs> i was gonna say that but then i thought no i'll change it but yeah, uh, yeah. but yeah no you really do i mean there is still uh, a very very strong argument for for physical media i mean i know that there are people out there saying why do you still why do you buy these things like why do you have these it doesn't make any sense everything is out there you can watch anything you want but that is not the case no it's and not it, the case it was, it was really encouraging to hear christopher nolan say that yeah, which is like that that Hollywood is now recognizing that the the movies aren't going to be there. Like they're, they're they're there for a limited time and then at their whim they will they will be gone. Uh, and you won't know when that's going to happen. They just one day you will want to watch it and it won't be there. So and monkeying around with stuff too, you know, the George Lucasing of a lot of things they'll they'll change it and you yeah. know for better or worse, sometimes episodes get taken off of streaming because they haven't aged well or whatever, yeah. something along those lines. Just yesterday, I finished watching, again, being sick, I finished watching Scrubs, my favorite TV oh, show yeah. of all time, and listening to the podcast, because again, they were talking about the podcast, streaming, they had to, they didn't have the rights for a lot of the music. That was such a music heavy show. They didn't have the rights. And it was what happened with WKRP in the 70s mm -hmm. when they didn't have the rights to it. So you got Dr. Johnny Fever jamming out to a song and it's like elevator music dubbed yes. over Led Zeppelin or something like that, you know, like, and that's yeah. exactly what happened with a lot of episodes of Scrubs and, you know, maybe a minor change on what, how it affects the scene or whatever, but it's still, they're changing the art that it was initially created as. Yeah. And, yeah. and the streaming services have been failing financially too, which is another lesson especially disney plus it seems it's like oh we spent a billion dollars on all these star wars shows and marvel shows it's like well maybe we shouldn't have made so many because it's like the revenue the way that works i can't break it down specifically but the way it works generally is that they're not getting their money back for these subscriptions fees after spending millions of dollars on all these um shows and all these uh, big time actors that they need for their shows or whatnot and uh, yeah, I mean, what's going to happen, right? That's what's going to happen. Best Buy got rid of all their Blu-rays, so no more Blu-rays at Best Buy. But what about, you know, like, we're going to have to go to like used CD stores and DVD places, Sunrise Records, places like that, that will have the physical media for a long time because they know. It's just like vinyl. It's almost like vinyl records. It's like, oh, you can come out with cassettes and CDs and people mm -hmm. still want vinyl, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of a different thing. But but the point is that if if the if this if the CDs aren't selling and people go back to vinyl, well, there's a reason. Like that's what they want, and yet the streaming services are just, man, they're just like I would hate to work for one of them, you know, because there's been so many layoffs, you know, um, and just yeah, they're not, not making so, even, so quickly, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, so let's we're just finishing up here. We're moving out of 2023. We're going to move into 2024. Um, things that you're looking forward to. So everybody probably has at least one thing they're looking forward to. I'll start out just to get us rolling. Um, X-Men 97, which I think is going to be out this year. I hope it's going to be out this year. Cause they <laughs> say it's going to be, um, I love like the, the original series I loved yes. and I bought a Magneto helmet. So I know it's going to be good. Yes, there you go. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the uh, I don't know. It's just one of those series that I just can't wait to see. Of, of for, especially in animation, I just I'm looking forward to it. I can't. I want to see what they do, what stories they tell, and that's going to be that's one of my picks for for what I'm looking forward to in, uh, in this year. Supposed All to be right. April. We'll, we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll watch it on the streamers. Uh, and yes. we'll see how it goes. <laughs> uh, Neil, what Neil? What about you? So I'm gonna go with Dune Part Two, as I already kind of touched on it. 
Um, yep. The first uh, Dune Part One, you know, Denny Villeneuve's uh, movie, um, I think was so much more impressive than some people kind of expected. Um, you know, I mean, this guy has been able to adapt things and, and come up with like Blade Runner 2049. He was able to come up with these movies that are just like so much better than we deserve, I find. You know, it's that they put so much heart and dedication into his movies that I can't wait to see what he does to really conclude this main story. It's not the end of the Dune books, of course. You know, the Dune books go on for a while. Um, but this is going to conclude the story. We're going to get um, Austin Butler plays Fade. So he's new in the movie. Fade is the character that Sting played back in the right. Night yeah. or David Lynch version. <laughs> I will like kill him, yeah. you know. <laughs> um looking forward to that uh christopher walken plays you know the emperor of the universe basically so how could you say no uh to that <laughs> don't you know um, <laughs> so you gotta have fun yeah you gotta have fun with that um but i can't wait to see how it unfolds and how you know what his directorial choices are you know i mean ever since i got into broadcasting and television and been been being a director at live sporting events and things like that i started to notice things like in movies and tv shows and video games too, where I go, oh, the director went with this angle. Oh, the director went with this, and he went with that. Um, there's a line in in the movie The Fablemans at the end, where speaking of David Lynch, David Lynch plays a, this character at the end of The Fablemans from last year, and he tells the kid, the young Steven Spielberg, basically, he goes like, "You see the horizon? It's up there. It's down there. If it's in the middle, your movie's boring. You're sunk." <laughs> yeah. And you go, "Well, that's true. It's like because you just notice directorial choices." So I can't wait to see what Villeneuve does with part two of this story. And, um, you know, where Paul Atreides and, and his mother and every and all the characters go. Um, and I know the books, I know the story, so I'm pretty sure I know kind of how it's going to go. Um, but it's just very, very terribly exciting. And uh, I'm sure there's a few more movies coming out next year that are going to be awesome. But that's the only one I can think of off the top of my head. So, yeah, Perfect. looking forward to that and looking forward to X-Men 97, bringing back some, not all, of the original cast that's still living. Um, yeah. And there's some controversy there, but whatever. <laughs> um, can't wait. Yeah. Can't wait to uh, to see both of those things. So yeah, I'll go do right. part two. All right, Ben. What about you? I am uh, I'm I'm cautiously optimistic, but really looking forward to seeing how Godzilla X Kong: The New Empire <laughs> turns out. <laughs> I know I'm going to make Larry shiver over there, but I again unabashedly, I actually I had low expectations for Godzilla versus Kong, and a side the human side was not very good. That was really get rid of that stuff, but the sheer ridiculous over the top spectacle of the kaiju battles and all of that was so much fun for me. And this looks so over the top ridiculous. Like it really, the monster verse in Hollywood is leaning into insanity. Like it's just, it's like a fever <laughs> dream at this point. And I, I, I can appreciate that for what it is. So am I expecting Godzilla minus one? Absolutely not, not a chance, but am I expecting like, like giant monsters punching each other? Yeah. And I, I'm looking yeah. forward to that. I really can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> beautiful <laughs> Larry what about you um, okay and so we've talked about how uh, franchises should scale back uh, because of fatigue however I'm very excited that Star Wars is not scaling back this year <laughs> <laughs> this year coming up we've got Skeleton Crew we've got The Acolyte we've got Bad Batch season 3 which is the f final season um, and uh, another season of Tales of the Jedi and possibly Andor season 2 there's there's talk that it might uh fall this year if not early 2025 but so so as as much as we've talked gone on and on about <laughs> franchise fatigue <laughs> i'm still excited about about my star wars i quite like it and these these ones particularly i think are very exciting especially the acolyte i want to see like the really early days that take takes place 200 years before a new hope uh or before um uh, Phantom Menace. So I'm 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 just really excited to see the direction that that that's going. Um, and interestingly, uh, I had on my list also the thing I'm not looking forward to is Godzilla X Kong. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, to me, the tr the trailer looks like um, another uh, Planet of the Apes, which is also coming out this year. And also I, coming I, out, yeah, yeah. And I thought to myself, why would they focus this movie, or at least the trailer? so much on the big monkeys when there is a when there's another planet of the apes movie coming out because that's exactly what it looks like to me it looks yeah. like monkeys that have evolved and are wearing armor and are you know do whatever they're in control of the of the their worlds and it just looks so similar to that i don't want it like to me 
like Godzilla versus Kong, the original was a one-off and it was hilarious and it was it's still one of my favorites, but that was it was a one-off for me. Like that was that was enough. But I did like the Kong movie, um the the new Kong movie. I just think this is too many monkeys. Too many monkeys. <laughs> I wanna, I, I want to see more flying creatures. I want to see more <laughs> Rodan. I want to see more Mothras. I want to see more King Kajuras. I want to see smog monsters. <laughs> just monkeys are just monkeys, you know. I don't know. <laughs> Of all the possibilities, why all the monkeys? Yeah. So we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Of course, I will go see it when it opens, but it's not. We'll go together. We'll balance it out. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Make movies better. <laughs> <laughs> all right well that's our uh, year in review uh 2023 we won't keep people much longer because it's uh it, it was it, i don't know we're about like an hour and 15 hour and a half so somewhere in there i don't know but it's a uh, it, it was epic let's put it yes. that way um <laughs> so i uh, thank you everybody for joining us for this and guys thank you once again ben and neil thank you guys for bringing your expertise it's uh it, it does it it break we it was a pretty well rounded episode I thought as far as like our opinions and yes. what we brought to the table there's a lot yeah. of different movies covered so thank you again for for all your uh, expertise on everything that you brought and uh, we'll I guess that's it we'll see you next time on Loop and Larry Guardians of Geek bye bye. <laughs>